Hey, how's it going? So, um, today I'm going to talk about The Outsiders, which is a sci-fi thriller suspense series from HBO Max. As you can see, I have my signs there for YouTube's uh, purposes, and I suppose mine. And sorry, of course, I'm not set up completely right. I was, everything was perfect, and then I had to disarray myself to, to adjust something. Okay, and this is take three, by the way. So, <clears throat> this show is a Stephen King story adaptation. And I have to say a few things about Stephen King, in praise of Stephen King, by the way. Um, and one is that he is my all-time, probably, highest influence as, an, as a writer because of the way, I love the way that you can read one of his stories and I find myself feeling like I'm in the room with the people in the story and like, or, or it could even be me inhabiting the character in the story because he is so good at drawing you in and his dialogue is so comfortable and so normal that I, I personally just, it, it just makes everything more real, it gives it so much more texture and depth. I just, I love it. And so when it comes to adaptations of his work on the screen, <laughs> I'll just say screen because it's both, you know, big screen and little screen. So, um, I, I just want to talk about the works of his that were like, or are my favorites that have been adapted, like The Stand. Okay, uh, full disclosure, I have not yet looked at the, uh, the latest version with Whoopi Goldberg, and I guess I should, but I don't think it's really going to alter what I have to say here. Um, I don't think that... The two that I want to talk about, which are The Stand and Salem's Lot, I didn't think they had been done justice. They were okay, but especially like when The Salem's Lot came out and The Stand, I don't think that any of the stuff that gets past the censors today would have back then that's in the book. And especially by today's standards, there's not anything all that terrible in there. There's like people that have sex, but it's not a pornography book. It's a book about people living lives in like desperate and scary situations. So um, I think Salem's Lot came first and it was weird seeing Hutch from Starsky and Hutch in it. And like I said, the state of censorship at the time wouldn't allow for or or even just like what everybody agreed on was okay in society was not as open as it is today so a lot of stuff that did like if you would look at it today you would be like oh my god how tame so um it was okay it got the story across but i just felt like that i, I wanted different actors <laughs> And I wanted more of the book in the show. So, um, but we, I think we all know what television does to adaptations of books. And then there are the movies. Um, actually, I guess The Stand both times was on television. I guess there's not a movie version of The Stand. So, like I said, I haven't seen that latest one, but I saw the first one. And... Uh, it uh it actually had a lot of the elements in the book and then they they gave it enough time to lay out a bunch of the story but have you ever seen that book like have you i have the unabridged version version it's about as thick as this phone is i have mine sideways so horizontal but the up down on my horizontal phone is about how thick that uh book is it's a tome <laughs> and i have read it probably 30 times <laughs> um 
so I definitely have in my mind ways that it should look. And the actor that they chose to play Randall Flagg, I didn't think he was scary. I had seen him in other stuff and kind of wasn't able to separate him from those other roles, but he was like a good guy. And Randall Flagg is basically the devil. So I was having a hard time buying this guy. And I don't know. It was serviceable, but it just wasn't it, you know? Or It, there's one that's a movie. So I'm not going to say that I liked that book, but I did read it. It scared the sh it out of me. <laughs> the, uh, the novel did. And I think part of what makes Stephen King's storytelling so, like, gut-wrenching at times is because there's always some kid involved. And usually it don't go well for at least one or two of the kids. And they don't talk about it. He doesn't talk about it in the stories. I mean, he does, but it's like that does something to you. <laughs> Having When you're a kid and one of your friends dies in some horrible way, that just reverberates outward and Fs people up. <laughs> so... I get it's a good device. It works. <laughs> um, I only saw the original It, the, the original version with Tim Curry, and that was enough. I don't need to revisit It. <laughs> yeah, it's really a scary one. And then this, this kid that's playing the clown in the newer one, uh, he's a Skarsgård, I believe. Yeah, I, I, just make sure I don't say Sarsgård and Skarsgård because... That's getting a bunch of blades tangled up in your mouth, and it's two different families, so you just want to be clear, it's Skarsgård. So, oh God, I'm, I can't think of the one's name uh, that was, well, he's the brother of the one that was in True Blood, <laughs> that was Eric the Viking, <laughs> or something like that. Anyway, this show, though, The Outsiders, also is a, like I said, it's a sort of a horror thing. And it's horrifying because it, it again involves kids that, well, there's a child molester killer guy. And, uh, I mean, the whole, the, the whole idea of it is disturbing, but it's like a microcosm or just like... A really tightly held lens. Hold, sorry, I have to still be arranging crap. It's just like a real tight focus on this little community. It's a small town in the northeast somewhere. and Probably Maine. I didn't even pay attention to that because he usually puts his stuff in Maine or New York or something. His area. That's fine. Excuse me. Uh, but, uh... It's like one of those classic Stephen King stories where you think one thing's going on and something completely else is. So the main character, and I didn't do all of the cast list and stuff on that board there. I'm just going to put it in the uh, information box because reasons. Anyway, uh, the main character is Ben is played by Ben Mendelsohn and he's Ralph. Oh, hold on. For some reason, no, <laughs> they put the cast in a like a dark screen or I have dark screen on my laptop, but they have his actual name and then the, the role that he played is in like, it's like charcoal against black. I cannot see and I can't remember. I just watched it, but something about doing these videos takes away like certain information out of your brain, like names. Okay, well, it'll be in the information box, but Ralph is a police detective in his town, and uh, like I said, there's a child, a serial child uh, murderer, and uh, this particular detective's son was one that got got. So he and his wife are dealing with that themselves and this is an ongoing thing 
and their main suspect becomes a guy from the neighborhood that everyone loves, a real sweetheart of a person, and that is uh, Terry Maitland, whose name I can somehow remember, and not the other guy. Uh, but he, Terry Maitland is played by Jason Bateman, and <laughs> funny thing about uh, Jason Bateman that uh, I just have to mention this here because you know I love my follicle focuses. So Jason Bateman, I've seen on Jimmy Kimmel promoting this, and they were sort of going over his whole backlog of acting roles, and. I forget what led up to it, but they start talking about Jason Bateman's hair. I guess it was like the pre-interview conversation that they had. But anyway, it, it came up that, you know, Jason Bateman's hair, like Jimmy Kimmel, I think he said something like, he looked like he was going to deliver pizza in the movie. <laughs> and uh, I guess... Jason Bateman is like grudgingly had the same hairstyle since like the 70s because his wife likes it and I can't picture him with like a high and tight haircut because I I don't think I've ever seen him with it <laughs> just the same sort of 70s hair mask thing of moderate length and mold not mask but, I mean, he's got a great head of hair. He can do whatever. I'm with his wife, though. I like that hairdo. Like, don't change it. <laughs> anyway, back to the story here. Um, and Terry is the accused, or becomes the suspect, well, and the accused. And he is, like, the Little League coach, and everybody loves him. And this is a really... People in this town are very close. And uh, they kind of support each other in ways that... This kind of bugs me about a lot of shows that there always a lot of emphasis on gotta save the family, doing it for the family or for my city, you know, like whatever it is. And it's always... It just is such a... It's like a throwaway line to me because... They say it, but, like, the stuff they're doing, well, how is this family exactly? Like, okay, I don't want to get off into a sidetrack that has nothing to do with this, but it just, I don't know, it just is like something that you say to sound or look a certain way, and then it doesn't. So it's just annoying. Um, and then... My family is not anything like these families that you're looking at. So it also makes me say, what are you talking about? <laughs> so um, in this one, though, these people in this little town, they are a close-knit community. And um, they're all sort of kind of better off than... Like, I didn't grow up all totally poor, but some of my family was, so I have seen what that looks like. And even they weren't as poor as poor can get, but, you know, if you're struggling to pay the bills, that, to me, equals poor. And these people are pretty well off. They live in houses, like actual houses and not apartments, and they're not renting. It's like their houses, and they have maybe multiple cars in a home with like maybe they once had kids like unfortunately this couple uh ralph and his wife what the hell was her name she was played by mayor winningham and she god this is terrible i can't see it at all well mayor winningham i should have checked this before i started you know what I'm going to keep talking, but maybe I can find this somewhere else where I can actually see what the hell I'm trying to look at. Uh, she's a professional. I think she works with kids or some kind of a teacher or something. Uh, but she is kind of holding her husband together and then 
Oh, let me see. What? No. God, it's like giving me her actual, her actual life. Like, I'm, that's not what I need to know. I need to know about her actor life. Oh, shoot. Taking a long time here. Sorry about that. I really wanted to be more together. <laughs> but here we go. White background so I can see stuff. So, Ralph Anderson and uh, Mayor Winningham's name is Jeannie. Oh, my God. I don't know how I don't remember that what with Jeannie Thomas being in the news. But anyway, um... She, um, you know, Ralph is like drinking and he's kind of going down and he's angry because he can't do anything about the death of this child. And so one of their friends, this Terry Maitland guy and his wife, uh, and she was played for, by Julianne Nicholson, who used to be on Law and Order as one of the uh, ADAs. And her name's Glory. And they have two daughters. And he, the, the dynamic that Terry has with his family is just so sweet. And so his wife is like really mad at Terry or, or at Ralph for arresting his husband, especially the way he did it. It was like in the most humiliating way possible because he was a suspected child molester and killer. But the thing is, like most Stephen King things, stories, what you're looking at is not necessarily what's really happening well, in life, too. Um, but it, let's just say there's a way that the creature character in the story makes it look like one person is in two places at once and the the place where the real person isn't is where the doppelganger is doing bad things with your same DNA and appearance. So it takes them a while to go around and around and figure it out like that that's happening. And another character that I enjoyed so much and is so crucial to the story and Another element that I always love about these Stephen King things is that the people have abilities. Like, they may be like, I am a psychic and I'm a medium and blah, blah, blah. Or they may just have a little touch of something that, you know, they have a knowing or they can sense things. And, you know, it's... People will dispute the reality of such things. All I can say about that is, is if you've ever been thinking about someone and they called or you saw them and somehow they showed up in your life and you had just been thinking of them that's a little bit of that like psychic supernatural thing so i think people shouldn't act like it's such a weirdo thing like we all have a little bit of it in some way but in the in stephen king stories you know people talk about it you know they don't dismiss its existence, which is interesting to me. I like that kind of thing, so that works for me. So one of the other characters, Ralph, after he arrests Terry, it just creates all these problems, and then he had already, because of his grief, had been behaving kind of messed up. So he ends up on suspension for a good portion of the show. But he's still trying to work the case because he's, you know, a cop, and that's kind of what keeps him from unraveling completely is to have this to put his mind on you know to keep it away from the grieving so um they finally start figuring out that there's like evidence of the one person being in two places and they're like this cannot be happening so they try to figure it out and one of the other characters is also a police officer, and he's still working. So he's kind enough to help Terry along uh, behind the scenes where he absolutely probably shouldn't because of rules, but he does, which is good, and it's good for the story. 
So they have that in, this, that access to information. And then there's, like I said, a group of friends in this town. So one of the friends says, hey, I got this, this great private investigator. She's kind of weird, but she's really good. And then another of the group says, oh, does she still have her spaceship or some stupid thing like that? And I thought, I'm going to like this person. So it turns out that it's, uh, the character's name is, do, 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 do. hold on. Her, the character's name is Holly Gibney. And, uh, she's played by Cynthia Erivo. And she's a black lady. And I will just say that she's, like, on the spectrum. <clears throat> but she has certain, like, I think she has, like, an eidetic memory. And then she has, like, this thing for stats and the ability to com to do computations with just the naked eye. Of things like how tall is, a like, an office building. She can look at it and either tell you the exact height or you know, really they're near about the exact height. So she just is peculiar, it works for the story, of course. And she's very, very bright. And she doesn't discount things that are right in front of her. So, and I think she has a little touch of the shining uh, too. Everyone ends up with it in this. So they find her and she starts investigating and she's able to find out things that, you know, like the police and I have not been able to get to or talk to people and find out stuff that they didn't know before. And so, and she's very instinctive about what she does. So, um... What was I going to say about her? Is that it? I don't know, but she is like a really big part of the story and figuring out the mystery. So, you know, this show, like, it came out in 2020. And the thing about it is, uh, I saw a few of the first episodes and I had some sort of issue with, like, either technical or... I didn't have the money to pay that subscription for a while, whatever it was, but I watched a few episodes and then I couldn't. And I was thinking for some reason, I had put it out of my mind that it wasn't that I couldn't pay for it, because I think that's probably what it was, is I couldn't pay for it for a little while, but then I could. But by the time I could again, I had forgotten that I had just stopped watching and there was more to come. I had forgotten that it was a series. I was thinking it was a movie. Like, I just, I watch a lot of stuff and there's also just a bunch of helium in here. So it's just, I forget. But I had somehow gotten myself to believe that it was one of those shows that was so good. And then, like, it fizzled out. And, it, it, like, this show didn't fizzle out. The this, this show, the series went on. My ability to pay for the platform fizzled out. So I guess that's just some story I told myself to make myself feel better. I don't know. But, um, and then I forgot about it again. Um, and then this writer strike thing happened. And, the, the, you know, I have several platforms. Like, even when I, like, don't have enough some month and don't have can't pay for two. I still have a bunch of options. Uh, and then I have just like regular cable TV and I just have a hard time finding that thing that does it for me that makes it, well, it makes it worth watching to come and do something like this and talk about it. But, um, I had watched all of my series. Like there was a bunch of finales. Everybody probably realizes this. And I was dreading that sort of, you know how there's like two weeks off so like reruns can play and stuff before something new starts or it's like about to be summer so everything's just gonna, well, in a normal case even everything would just kind of go to sleep, <laughs> do summer hibernation, <laughs> but then the writer's strike happened and 
man, I like I feel like I'm feeling that really hard and I thought that's kind of kooky. But then I saw something online today and it was uh oh, it was like a commencement speech and it was some TV executive <laughs> that was doing the speech and the audience was heckling him to pay the writers properly and bring them back to work. So the writer's strike is touching a lot of people in places I didn't expect that. Like I am, I don't, no one's buying anything I write, but I write, I've been writing for years. I am a writer, so I feel for these people. And I grew up in Hollywood and I've done a little bit of work in the industry and know a ton of people from the industry in Hollywood. Like I have a pretty good sense of what this, how this is affecting people. So, um, and I, I, and I feel like across the board, not just the writers, the writers are the highlight right now, but there's a whole gang of people on the set. And then after, you know, the post-production work, there's another whole battalion of people that work on stuff. So I'm just saying, I feel like the whole industry uh, deserves more respect and the people in those unions, like, the unions are great if they can work for you, but then if the other side that you have to deal with and your union has to deal with is being a jerk and doing things like short shrifting the writers uh, on their writer's room work, like that's, they may be laughing and having fun, but it's still work. You still got to sit in there and do that job in the room and get the work done. So, you know, it's subjective, but still... Anyway, I'm, I felt like I was feeling that. And then um, there's been a lot of stuff sort of like related to the shift. And, uh, but there, there's not just one the shift. Everybody has a the shift to their own self. And we're always shifting, shifting like every moment is a shifting. But, um... Stuff like that was going on, astrological stuff, um, just, like, I'm constantly doing self-work, you know, like, trying to purge and transmute, like, my stuff, old stuff. Like, I'm not going to go into a whole discussion about all of that. There's plenty of it out there that you can find that will give you a much better description than I'm going to be able to. I can only talk about my own thing, but... I was definitely feeling some stuff, and for about two weeks, I have just been sort of, like, very little, it was like no touch Twitter for most of last week, and I have Facebook, but I usually just share stuff to there, I'm not actually on there much, uh, and I was just, like, nothing, there's stuff to watch and whatever, but I just kind of wasn't into it and then I have a bunch of projects that I have either that I'm working on or that I have lined up and it just I guess started to feel like I don't know like I have I always feel guilty for feeling stressed out because my life is comparatively from the past so stress free but even my own stuff was just feeling like you know, like a, a boulder just barely holding back from becoming an avalanche just right over your head. Like, I just felt like pressure, you know? So I kind of, and I've already been on a, 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 a thing where I'm like, let me shut everything off for a while and like not have the electrical stuff going and, you know, going outside and spending as much time out there as I can just kind of I just working on like actually clearing my mind and I got really good at it and I thought of it as like mental tofu because if you know tofu at all and you haven't like you just get it out of the little container and it's this little rectangle that's kind of squishy and jiggly if you taste it I mean it has a flavor but it ain't much of a flavor and it's just really good at sort of marrying with whatever you let it hang out with for a little while. Like, whatever you cook it with, it's going to take on that flavor. It's not, you're not really going to taste like tofu. 
Although, if you just start eating it, you're totally going to taste it. I've been just really used to it. But anyway, I was feeling like, like that's what came to mind. I was like, I am tofu right now. Like, <laughs> I just, I would be watching something and I would just like turn it off. Because I wasn't really into it. And on another day, I might have totally been, you know, even if it was a rerun or something. But I just, I don't know, I was just in this weird mood. And I... I came across this show and I was so happy and I was watching it. But as I was watching it over the past two weeks, I realized that it even looks like it's kind of underwater. And that's how I was feeling on this side of the screen, even before I started watching it. So I don't know, like that sort of sensation made it really easy for me to tune into it. And um, I actually don't want to give away a bunch of stuff about this, but what I wanted to actually say about more about this town and these people in it the way that they get together and like figure out not everyone but a core group enough people to handle this problem because it's not something that everyone's even going to believe and that comes up like even in the group they're having a hard time <laughs> believing stuff but they get there <laughs> but um well the thing about the group is they behave in a way that like, family, 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 even on these fictional programs, don't actually always behave. And they really, like, came together with each other out of love. And so, you know, I was talking about how the a lot of the characters are well off. Well, at another point in the story, they come to people in places where they're not so well off. And these people have always been in sort of a lower echelon of the community on the status ladder. They're on the lower rungs. And they're kind of resentful. And it's like an intrusion to have all these like legal people coming in, like law enforcement. But... Once they finally get an understanding of what's going on, they too all pull together to like all save the community from this threat, from this menace. And um, that was actually like really good to see on the level of family, community, get save it. You know, you failed your city, <laughs> like that kind of thing. Oh, and that's another thing. Like I, that line I just said, you failed your city. That's from the uh, the Arrowverse, the actual Arrow series, um, and that's what Oliver Queen the Arrow used to say. But so this series is on HBO Max, and that is like where you can see WB stuff or Warner Brothers, and Warner Brothers is your DC universe prov provider <laughs> purveyor. And a couple of times they mentioned, like, DC comic characters or I think they said something about Crisis, which was a story arc that has appeared in DC Comics. It was a big deal if you watch the shows or read the comic books. It kind of upended the whole world. And I loved that. Like, I, I see a lot of stuff on YouTube about, here's a bunch of Easter eggs you missed. And it's like, how the hell do you know what I missed? Shut up. Anyway, um, and they weren't like Easter eggs. They were just like right out there in the dialogue. I just liked that they included it. And because I, I do, I reference that stuff all the time. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to the story. They figured it out and they solved it. And even though like some of the character interactions are somewhat unreal to me because they're not of my experience, doesn't mean that something like them doesn't happen, you know, doesn't exist in reality. And that's cool. That's all good. <laughs> um, overall, though, this was truly like, you know, I was ready for all of it, but it is unsettling and it is kind of scary because it makes you think there are, we do have doppelgangers. They're not necessarily out, you know, running around doing bad work with your image and your, 
you know, characterization or characterization with your character, they're not necessarily out there making you look bad, but it could happen because, yeah, it could happen. Excuse me. Okay. My mouth is so dry that I have to drink a gallon, but I didn't. I need to. So I guess I'm done. Thank you and good night. Am I done? Well, I guess I'm done. I can't think of anything else to say. <laughs> Thank you.